everyone! Welcome to episode number 591 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. This week, my guest is Mark Benton from TE Connectivity, and we're talking all about rugged optical transceivers. Mark and I discuss how these transceivers can enable flexible embedded solutions, the challenges of unbalanced input and output channel counts in military and aerospace designs, and the benefits that modularity can bring to these kinds of designs. Also this week, I check out how you can take a trip to the outer edge of the stratosphere with the help of a space balloon. (laughs) So first, please welcome Mark Benton to Fish Fry. Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Excellent. Okay, so we're talking about designing modularity into rugged optical transceivers that enable flexible system solutions today. Before we dig into the solutions in this space, many military and aerospace applications deal with unbalanced input and output channel counts. Can you talk about these kind of configuration challenges? Sure. If you think about big data pipes in VPX systems, you're typically looking at Ethernet or something like that. That's basically a lot of high-speed channels and they're full duplex. And in those situations, it's a big data pipe, and it's equal numbers of transmits and receives on both ends. That's pretty typical. But there are other applications in the space where you have a lot of inputs and a few destinations, or you have a lot of destinations and only a few inputs. So a couple of examples of that are, look at in-flight entertainment and commercial airplane. The OEM who's building the server switch that has to feed all that information to the airplane has basically a storage server with, you know, movies and content on it. And they have their KSAT live streaming satellite interface to the airplane for Ethernet and, you know, Wi-Fi, things like that. Well, there you've got basically a few inputs, but you may have 50 or 100 or 300 seats on the platform, depending on how big the aircraft is. And so a lot of those applications get designed with a single server but the number of fiber links you need to service the airplane varies. So they need a transceiver where they can add as they build into bigger platforms. So that's one example. The other example that we've seen is a case where you have displays, avionic displays. And there you've got four displays in your cockpit, something like that. It's a small number. But you have radar. You have ground geography information. You've got cameras all is inputs that can be selected for those servers to display on those displays, or in some cases processed and then turned into one image to display. Well, there you might have eight inputs, but four outputs. And that's all you need. And so the standard configurations of the smaller parallel transceivers just doesn't fit that need and doesn't fit the need to change the channel count or to have unbalanced channels in each direction. So that's where some of the ideas that we're working on kind of help solve that problem, basically providing as much as you need based on the platform. And it's configurable, much like you plug transceivers into a switch in a datacom market. Same basic idea. The other thing that it does is it allows for repairability. So if something should get damaged in assembly, being modular, you can replace single channels. You're not forced to replace an entire transceiver, for example. So, Mark, what kind of benefits does modularity bring to these kinds of applications? It's cost from the system level because you design one circuit and you use it in multiple platforms. That's typically the case. And you can configure that platform and the number of I.O. channels you need based on building out, or you can install a minimum system and then in the future is added capacity, is added, say, even on a given platform. You can add the additional connectivity, the optical connectivity and the transceivers that you need to expand the capability in the future. And as I said before, repairability is a big deal. The other thing that we run into is that there are multiple connector standards that are used on some of these systems. A lot of them are single fiber. And so having a modular transceiver like this allows us to marry it up to whatever particular fiber type or fiber ferrule that that particular customer may have selected or specified 
or in some cases, their customer has specified. So TE's multi-gig RT fiber optic chiclet-based optical transceiver platform is looking to help solve these design concerns, right? Can you tell me more about this solution? Basically, there's two key elements to the chiclet, to the multi-gig RTFO platform. One of which is the fact that if you look inside of a standard transceiver, everything that's important fits on two small one by two millimeter ceramics that basically puts that device on the tip of my finger. Well, once I've done that, I can build some very small single channel transceivers. The drive to marry that technology to the RT2 electrical connector that's used on the plug-in cards really evolved out of a real life customer application where they needed a modular system from one to 12 channels and one to 10 gigabit speeds, depending on what part of the system it was going to be used for. And they didn't have space. And the engineers involved on the team were familiar with multi-gig from past work on its signal integrity and realized that RT2 was 10 gig capable. And so they put those two ideas together and basically took the little flat transceiver and stood it on its edge and built a modular platform from 1 to 12 channels. And once you realize you can do that, then you realize you can do things like you can build two transmitters on that blade or two receivers. They don't have to be transceivers. And again, that just allows you, if you got five transmits and five receives, well, you can put five slots in and have two, two, a transceiver and two, two receivers, and you've done it all just like that. So there's a lot of different ways that that comes to play. But the real breakthrough with marrying the electrical capability and the pedigree of the multi-gig electrical connections to the circuit board to this miniaturized optoelectronic assembly, basically. All right, Mark, let's get out your crystal ball. What does the future look like for these solutions? It's kind of interesting because while it wasn't in anyone's mind at the time, if you fast forward to today and to where things are going and you look at the speeds of these small embedded transceivers, they're now running 25 gigabits a channel, so 100 gigabits in both directions, right? And with the development of the high-density multi-gig RT that's being considered by Vita, you have five differential electrical RT-based connections to the circuit board which now means I can do things like put a four-channel version of this chiclet transceiver on these next-generation wafers. So I now have a wafer that's not just more electrical. I have the ability to make that optical and have the ability to make it pluggable to the backplane by doing some things on the connectivity side optically. And so in a way, we've kind of come full circle from the serendipity of marrying those two to solve that customer's space problem back to something that fundamentally could save a lot of space for Vita cards in the future, particularly as the speeds go to 112, you know, 56 gig PAM4 is kind of the edge right now. The high density multi-gig is capable of 112 PAM4. So there's plenty of headroom, you know, in terms of higher speeds. And so we can see those things kind of coming back full circle again. All right, Mark, it is time for your off-the-cuff question. Now, you have an amazing voice, and you were a DJ some time ago. So do you have any DJ stories you can share? Well, yeah. I think the last time I was here, I talked something about how I was a disc jockey and played um, Love Train or something like that. Well, for a, um, let's just say, an anniversary birthday, there was an opportunity to go back as an alumni and redo a radio show which I did. And um, to give you a sense of how old I am, even though I provided two hours of music, there wasn't two hours of that music on their database because, of course, today there's not vinyl. It's all MP3s. And so uh, it turned into a bit of like the old gig where we just had to make up the last half hour as we went. And because it's streamed live, my wife's phone starts lighting up with requests from Chicago I'm sitting in Champagne, and so it literally was a real live radio show. I have a recording of it, but I won't bore you with it. I love that so much. Well, Mark, it is always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for joining me. Happy to talk to you. 
If you want even more information about TE Connectivity's multi-gig RT connectors, I chatted with Ryan Hill in a recent Chalk Talk where we explored the benefits of those connectors and how they can help empower the next generation of military and aerospace designs. And you can check out this episode of Chalk Talk by clicking the link below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com or click the link in the description of this week's YouTube episode as well. So, are you interested in going to space but don't have the cash to plunk down for a Musk or Bezos sponsored flight? Well, let me introduce you to Spain's EOS X Space and their new space balloons. <laughs> but wait, I hear you loud and clear, my fish frying audience. Space balloons aren't new. In fact, they are not. Space Perspective, based in Florida, has been working on space balloon rides for a while now. Since 2020, Space Perspective has been developing a capsule called Spaceship Neptune, which can take one pilot and up to eight passengers to an altitude of around 100,000 feet. That capsule is actually slung beneath a hydrogen-filled space balloon. In order to descend, Space Perspective's space balloon gradually releases its hydrogen gas. But now EOS X space is getting into this space exploration via balloon game. <laughs> they announced in June that they are now finalizing development of their own capsule and are planning on beginning commercial flights from their bases in Abu Dhabi and Seville, Spain in the third quarter of next year. So what sets EOS X space apart from space perspective? Well, a couple things. First, the EOS X space uses a helium-filled balloon instead of hydrogen. Their capsule can only carry seven passengers and a pilot, but this bad boy can go up to over 131,000 feet. EOS X Space says the trip will be about two hours to ascend, two hours to cruise in the stratosphere, and then another hour to descend and land. But you guys, I think what sets the EOS X Space apart the most is that it's fancy. The EOS X space will have panoramic views, ergonomic seats, mood lighting, an onboard bar, and yes, a bathroom. But you're going to have to shell out a lot more for fancy, of course. While a ride on the spaceship Neptune from space perspective will run you about $125,000, the EOS X space is somewhere between 160,000 and 215,000. So if that wasn't fancy enough, EOS X space is also working on a space hub complex in Seville. So prior to traveling to the launch base by helicopter, the Space Hub Complex gives passengers the opportunity to stay at a luxury hotel for a few days while partaking in activities such as zero-gravity plane rides and VR space mission simulations. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, doesn't that sound amazing? So, if you want even more information about EOS X Space or more information about TE Connectivity, their multi-gig RT connectors, or their fiber optic CBOT platform, I've included a bunch of links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? 
Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash eejournal. If you're into X, you can monitor our tweets at eejournaltfm. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing... I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we are also on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And, of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, make sure that you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of July 19th, 2024, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs> <laughs>